Good afternoon. This is part three of the Vermont House Human Services Committee on Wednesday, uh, April 28th. Um, and <clears throat> committee, my uh, this is an extra time on some level because I thought that maybe the House floor was going to take longer today. Um, <clears throat> I think based on where we got this morning, uh, in terms of S20, I just want to repeat that um, we'll be taking it up again Thursday morning around 1030 or 11, <clears throat> depending upon how long, um, around 1030. And <clears throat> at that time, if anyone has uh, amendments to bring it there, um, I think we can, uh, I think we are finally at a point where we can um, take action um, on the bill. And so we will do that uh, tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> and that will then give Katie whatever time she needs <clears throat> to put it together um, so that it would be, um, assuming there is a majority of the committee that uh, supports passage of the bill, it would be um, on the calendar next week. Uh, <clears throat> but I thought um, I would <clears throat> bring us together um, <clears throat> in terms of just Having a little, having a little bit of a discussion about the resolution um, that is now a bill, um, we had some great, um, great discussion and testimony this morning. <clears throat> I do want to let folks know that uh, I think it's Rights and Democracy. I'm now going to forget the group <clears throat> is having a. Um, a quote unquote lobby day on Wednesday. So for those of you, um, for I wanna say for um, Taylor and Dane, if we had been in the building when groups um, come in and they bring their members, um, whether it's the childcare group or whether it is people with disabilities or um, other groups like this, um, they oftentimes ask for time in front of the committee and we give them um, as much as we can we uh, give them the opportunity to uh, to present themselves and to um, testify. And uh, so um, they are coming next Wednesday. And um, I received an email at, saying that they would like some time in front of our committee to talk about um, and <clears throat> to have individuals who are members um, um, in particular of the um, BIPOC community to uh, share their views on legislation in front of us. Um, and so um, I took them up on that and said, please come at, I forget whether it's 11 or 11.15 um, next Wednesday. Um, and uh, thinking that they might have comments on the <clears throat> resolution, I gave them the list of the bills that we have considered um, and um, then also um, said if there are other issues that relate to uh, human services for them um, to do that. But so we'll have about, I suggested <clears throat> in talking um, in emailing um, uh, the, um, the, the director that for uh, individuals to plan on no more than half an hour of comments because knowing us, um, we like to ask questions or at least acknowledge and say something. Um, so I say that in terms of as we think about the resolution, I'm not asking us to be making a vote on it right now, but I think we should talk about what we're doing. What was the name of that group again, Madam Chair? Julie, I think it's Rights and Democracy. Right, Vermont Rights and Democracy, and RAD is their acronym. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and actually, as we're talking about business before we do that, um, various of us, not me, have had uh, <clears throat> interns um, during the year um, and uh, done some research or things like that. And uh, Jessica has um, asked one of one of Jessica's interns or Jessica's intern has been 
okay, Jessica's intern um, <clears throat> has actually been looking at what the Senate did with um, our child care bill. And um, so uh, I was thinking, um, I think Jessica, you asked if she could come on Wednesday, maybe if she could come Wednesday, is that what you asked for? Yeah, and I was willing though anytime, I just put that out there as a time for a few minutes. Well, um, well um, why not Wednesday morning? Okay. You know, at nine. So to, to start out and um, um, Dan, I know that you have an intern. Um, do you want to introduce your, would your intern like to um, have their five minutes of YouTube fame and to come on to uh, in the committee room? I think that would be fantastic. I'd love to invite him. Thank you. Oh, okay. So do you think we could um, have, have him come at, um, on Wednesday morning as well? Yeah, I will send him an email. Thanks uh, for does, thinking. <laughs> does anyone else have interns? <clears throat> okay. And then we'll figure out the rest of the schedule. Um, okay, so um, the resolution treated as a bill. Um, there's been uh, some, th th there's been some testimony in terms of um, and there's been some questions from, from Topper and others, and there's been some testimony about maybe looking at uh, what the whereas is are. Um, and um, at the same time, um, there's also been a suggestion to just sort of leave it as is. So I'm curious as to where people are. I'm happy to start this one off for <laughs> us. Um, I uh, am happy with the resolution as is. And the reason behind that is that this is coming directly from uh, Black members of our community who have done this research, who have cited their sources, who used a majority of Vermont data to illuminate what these health inequities look like already in our state. And I think the most compelling testimony that we've received so far was from Commissioner Levine and talking about the direct impact that it had at the Department of Health. They made this declaration of racism as a public health emergency. And what emerged from that was a health equity group that helped them with their COVID response to be more um, directed and, and understanding that we don't have the data here in the state and being able to support folks across racial identities. And a majority of the time, we just default with whiteness. And so that's what we saw with the Department of Health. But when they made that declaration, we saw significant improvements, as I've mentioned right here in Winooski. We saw pop-up sites. We saw a multi-generational vaccine clinics and understanding how housing is set up for various communities. And I think this is just us not only falling in line with our Department of Health, who are the experts when it comes to uh, social determinants of health and the health of all Vermonters, but also recognizing that it, it will push us farther in the work that we're doing here in the legislature to make sure that we are being considerate and, and understanding of the various communities that we have historically ignored, I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. <clears throat> Carl, you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just thought a uh, point of interest. Uh, we, I think we all received, a, well, mine was referred by somebody else, but uh, a letter from Robert Richard, who is tribal councilman of the Abnaki Nation of Missisquoi. And he's, he's making a point here about not treating all of the minorities the same by the use of BIPOC. I don't know if you've seen this letter, but it's uh, it's addressed to all, of, well, it, it sent to all of us anyway, apparently, and stating, and it sort of goes along with what Case said this morning, that we shouldn't treat them all the same. The black community, the Hispanic community, the indigenous community, et cetera. So I just thought it was interesting did anybody else get that letter or see it? There are a lot of nods. You're getting a lot of nods. So, so uh, some of us are more up to date with our emails than others. So, um, Carl, are, so Carl, is what you are suggesting that we take a look at the whereases and make sure that we um, 
and, and add some or um, differentiate between populations? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, possibly. I, I just thought it was interesting how this person is substantiating or not necessarily substantiating, but agreeing with something a case brought up this morning that we can't look at it as one group of people called uh, BIPOC, okay? Not that the resolution necessarily says it, but it's implied because it's, it's grouping them all together. So, and obviously, I mean, you know how I feel on this, that we shouldn't use it, the resolution as a resolution on racism, but as a, you know, joint resolution relating to racial, ethnic, cultural, and I would say circumstantial disparities that need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Mary Beth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, uh, similarly to Representative Small, feel, um, I guess I feel really um, protective of this resolution because it was composed by people of color, um, people from the Black community. And, um, you know, it, it, it's important to me that, um, that, you know, myself as a white person, I don't want to swoop in and kind of start messing with things that I, you know, I, I really, that don't directly affect me and that I don't really um, understand all the reasoning for it being there. So I feel similarly, like I really trust that the people who came together felt these were important data points that they wanted to emphasize and and I'm, I'm good with that. And I did appreciate Case's perspective. I really did. It was really an important perspective. And I appreciate what he said about um, not pulling out one group, you know, a data point from one group and really, you know, providing data for all of the groups. I would say in Vermont, one of our challenges is we don't have the data. We haven't captured a lot of this data. So that's, it's a great aspiration, but it's a problematic reality because we don't have the data captured in many cases. Um, so, you know, I appreciate his perspective. I also, you know, have heard from many of my um, black and brown brothers and sisters that they are very, you know, they feel there are systemic structural issues and I, I have had to really hum be humble and hear that and really learn from that. And I guess I don't feel comfortable starting to kind of toy with something that, um, you know, is just really, I, I just want to trust the people that put it together and, and really take their word that these are the important points to emphasize. Thanks, Mary Beth. Jessica, go ahead. I just sorry, I didn't know I was unmuted. I um, <laughs> I wanted to just agree with um, Mary Beth and Taylor. I I thought a lot about too today what um, what we heard on on with two very different perspectives, and it was helpful to me to think about that because some of what I heard is very similar to what I hear when I go home to Rhode Island to my brother and we have similar discussions. And one thing that struck me at the end was when um, Burr, is that right? Am I pronouncing her name right? When she told us that, remember, this is a statute. I mean, this is not a statute. This is a resolution that as Mary Beth said, is coming from the, um, black, I don't need, after reading the, all the letters today now, I'm not sure, should I say BIPOC or should I say, <laughs> but, um, but it's coming from the community that's the most impacted. And um, that to me, the whole idea of it not being a statute is because we need to allow more collection of data. There just isn't the data. And that's one of the things that I'm always sort of talking about is do we have the data? And we don't have the data for a statute. So we need this resolution in order to move in the right direction and fill in those holes and understand them better. Um, the other thing for me 
is to, I think a lot about what this committee did and I wasn't there here when you did this, but the work on the trauma um, uh, bill and how we talked a bit this morning about whether or not um, racism itself is a, why are, why is there more illness or more, um, you know, more illness around um, the black community? What's the difference between um, putting um, economically disadvantaged or whatever? And I think that the big difference is that that 400 year history of trauma that gets into your genetics. I mean, one of the things I think it was um, Mark Levine who talked to us about um, that it's cumulative. It, it's inside of you, your babies and their baby, and then the next set of babies that it becomes part, that trauma is inside. And so there really is a difference in the, um, not the uh, black community, that they've been dealing with all kinds of trauma that has damaging long-term effects. And it's not just physical health, but mental health as well, that we all know, and um, I hardly ever refer to my um, significant other in this environment, but, I, but we've talked a lot about this and as well, and the unbelievable importance of that your mental well-being on your physical health. And there just isn't a community that has been more impacted, um, both physically and mentally, I believe, through, by the trauma from their past. And so I'm very supportive of moving forward on this and being able to collect the data and really look, and, and also bring attention to the importance of this work um, for all of us, like in the hospitals and in state government, making sure that we're remembering and putting this forward as an important thing. So anyhow. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> I wish I could um, pull out, <clears throat> which I can't right now, um, a film that I have shown uh, in my class um, that, uh, if you, um, and now I'm gonna forget what the word is. Um, if you, <clears throat> regardless of economic um, if, situation, uh, in particular, this was about women. Women's health outcomes are worse. So if your income, if, you, if your income is the same, um, uh, the, um, as it relates to women, um, the um, your your health is worse. Your health outcomes are are, are less healthy if you are a um, woman of color. Um, so it's not um, <clears throat> it's not solely where you um, it's, you know it, it's not solely if you are um, living in an, a more impoverished situation. Um, and I wish I had Topper. I wish I could remember a the name of the film and b the um, <clears throat> the data. Um, but if you control for um, uh, economics, um, race seems to be the factor. Dane, Madam Chair, why did you refer to me on that? Because you because you asked the other because you asked about um, um, you asked earlier about data. And where it was from, and so I was being, I was trying to. Um, um, I know that that's important, and so I was just. Yeah. My yeah. question was, why are people of color more susceptible mm. to disease? Okay, can't answer that, Dane. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, just giving my two cents on this. Um, really enjoyed our conversation this morning and the different perspectives and ways of looking at this. Um, I think I am at a place where I support the bill or the resolution as as written, um, based on a lot of feedback that we've gotten as far as it's it's a resolution, it's not statute. 
Um, it's really about sending a message and that there are a lot of people that are involved in it and feel that uh, that are stakeholders that are supportive of it. Um, while I love to edit things and no. um, get into all of that, I uh, this is a point where I feel like, yes, it's time to sort of step back and um, other people have put a lot of thought into this. Um, I think that um, also just going to the word racism uh, as kind of the subject, um, I don't think that uh, focusing on racism necessarily ignores other issues or, or uh, you know, minimizes other issues. There are so many other disadvantages that we need to consider, but we also, I think, um, need to name racism. And I, I think it is notable, Carl, I appreciate what you said about there's something about naming racism that divides us. Um, it creates um, division and tension. And I think one of the potentials of a resolution like this is that it could sort of get us closer to where talking about racism isn't something that divides us as much. It's something that we accept, we're able to talk about, we're able to work on. Um, it's a part of our sort of, uh, you know, vocabulary. Um, and yeah, I also just think, you know, looking at making an economic inequalities or something else as the, I, I think that um, there are just so many overlapping factors um, within uh, health outcomes, you know, and it isn't just racism, but I think we do see across the board, a lot of points, it um, does point back to um, race. And I think that um, we need to look at that and address it. And again, I don't think it's minimizing economic uh, opportunity or anything like that. So that's my two cents. Thanks, Dane. Carl. Thank you. Just another anecdotal comment. I, I gave this resolution to my son-in-law and asked him to read through it also. And he had almost the exact same uh, reaction as as Case did, and especially on sort of the the name of the thing, which is uh, uh, what we call joint resolution, uh, saying racism is uh, essentially a public health crisis. He couldn't understand why we were using that term. I think he thought more like I did. Why don't we attack the the issues uh, that are pointed out in the resolution that there are disparities and work on those instead of going ahead and working on using a term that I, I know regardless of what Dane says, but I mean, I appreciate what he said, but I think it is, it's a more divisive word and keeps us from really dwelling on the issues that, uh, that are important to, to this, these different groups of people, uh, whether they be uh, uh, people of color, uh, indigenous, uh, Hispanic, et cetera. So anyway, I, uh, I just thought it was interesting that my son-in-law had, the, and as you know, he's a man of color also. So he, he had the exact same reaction. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Teresa. I didn't even get a chance to get my hand all the way up, Madam Chair. Um, it was that leaning forward. I know, that leaning forward. <laughs> um, so I think the use of the word racism is important, important. I think it's important because um, it calls attention to the disparities that are there. And um, what I hope is that the use of such a word doesn't um, close people's, you know, eyes, ears, minds to the underlying issues that people of color face in Vermont. And um, so I hope it's not like a one or the other kind of kind of choice for people. And. I, I really, really appreciated the conversation this morning um, with um, both of the witnesses. And um, I, I really feel like um, both of them gave us things to think about. And if, if I were sitting down and writing the resolution, I would 
um, I, I would look, you know, seriously at some of those questions that um, I'm trying to pronounce his name correctly. Uh, oh yeah. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> um, uh, that he brought up, I, I didn't agree with them all, but I thought that some of them, you know, had had some um, validity to think, you know, to further thought. But I, it, for me, the thing that I think that um, sits with me at this point in time is um, Bohr's statement and um, Dr. Levine's statement, similar statement that until we name something, until we call attention to it, we won't devote the resources to it and we won't collect the data and, you know, um, and, and we won't be informing ourselves. And without that information, you can't improve things. And um, so that's, that's where I lean on um, the people who spent many hours coming up with this language and um, feeling like I'm, I don't feel like, um, since it's not a law and it's the intention of it is to call attention to the issue and to, for us to start to collect more data on it and to help to improve systems that it's, I don't feel like it's necessary to change it. And I, I feel like, um, you know, I've reviewed the data that backs it up and I feel like, um, you know, the, the statements that are made are backed up by data, most of which is Vermont data. And um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with it um, the way it is. Although, like I said, I really did appreciate the conversation this morning of multiple viewpoints on it. Thank you. <clears throat> Carl. Sorry, sorry for it, oh. but uh, we're talking- Do not apologize. We're talking about data. And I think uh, uh, Kamulia made a good point that data by itself doesn't indicate causation, okay? There's a piece of data that uh, uh, there is a greater preponderance of sickle cell anemia amongst uh, black people. And, uh, and that definitely that's, that's a, a racial issue because it's something having to do with race itself, not having anything to do with racism, but that's a piece of empiric evidence that is collected and doesn't necessarily mean that the cause of that is racism, okay? And that's what I was getting at in many of these disparities that are mentioned. Uh, I call them disparities, okay, anyway, that they are, uh, they may be race-based, but probably, I mean, you know, I don't think so, but I mean, there maybe some of them are, but the, uh, so many of them are not. I mean, the, the, the multi-generational family living conditions and, the uh, greater exposure because of that to people with COVID and all that, it really in many ways have nothing to do with race. It's a cultural plus what I would call a circumstantial issue. Many of them are, are people coming into this country and that is the most efficient way to live is in a more communal setting. And it has nothing to do with race. It has to do with the circumstance of coming to this country and trying to live economically like a I mentioned about my family when they came to the United States from Sweden. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out, that data by itself doesn't mean causation. It, it, it's important, but we have to be careful. We don't just say, well, it has to be this way because you know more people uh, that are black have this particular situation. It does, it's not the causation connection. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carl. Uh, Kelly. Uh, well, that just has kind of made me think about what Bohr said at the end that, you know, this resolution is not saying what should be done with the data that's collected, and it is not saying what the solutions are, and it is not saying um, what the path is forward. It's it's a beginning statement, and um, I think keeping the term racism in there is important. Uh, as you know, looking at systems and underlying issues, it, it is a factor and not acknowledging it, I think does more detriment than it would be helpful. Thanks, Kelly. Mary Beth. 
Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just think it's it's super important for us to not like not decide that anything is not caused or caused. Like we're not we're not medical people. We don't know all of the underlying factors. There are a lot of underlying factors for people that relate to race. Uh, you know, some of the generational trauma that. Jessica referred to earlier, you know, I, I think it's just important that we really um, are open to, you know, everyone, some people come, you know, as refugees, other people have lived here longer than, than my family has. <laughs> I, I just think there is no one way or another. I just think we have to maintain an open mind that there are many ways that these health disparities are result. And I believe that race is one of them. Race is one of the contributing factors. Um, so I just wanna be careful of us making these blanket statements that, you know, I, I just think we have to be really mindful of people's experience, of people's, uh, you, know, um, you know, the social determinants of health back generations which lead to these outcomes and are definitely based in race. Um, I, I want to leave an open space for all of the possibilities re relative to people's um, physical and mental and emotional challenges that they deal with. I, I would encourage us, um, the resolution talks about racism and system, systemic racism. It doesn't talk about race. It talks about racism and systemic racism. And I think that <clears throat> we, um, we need to sort of keep that in mind. Um, Jessica, then Kelly. Um, just a little, this is just a little add on to what Mary Beth was saying and what I said earlier about um, why, um, some of the issues um, around healthcare are um, more difficult maybe than other, other of us. Um, and that, it, the other one that I remember, and I can't even remember who said this, but was around um, the learning in medical school and nursing school about um, people of color and what their, how high their pain tolerance is and how they right. handle certain medications and all these things that impact when you are treating a person in that way, it impacts their health long term. And so um, there's another issue. And the other piece is just the piece of how they're treated inside of the healthcare system. Um, is it always, and that's the work I think that hospitals are doing right now, but that's an important thing. And then there's the piece of, if you're a black um, physician and you walk into a room and, so, and you hear regularly, are you here to pick up the lunch, my lunch um, stuff from our room? And what that, how that impacts that um, physician or a nurse mm -hmm. and um, the long-term impacts of that as well. I mean, there, there's so many, um, we <clears throat> keep raising our hand and keep telling more stories, I'm sure that we, um, we all know of, but there are, it's sad that there are as many as there are. And uh, Jessica, thank you. Thank you for centering um, and giving examples in terms of health care. This is not a resolution about race, and this is not a resolution about health care. This is a resolution about racism and public health. And public health is, um, is wider than health care. It is those, it includes <clears throat> those elements of our daily lives that impact our health outcomes. It talks about where we live, where we get our food, what the quality of our housing is, what the quality of our food is, as well as how the <clears throat> mental health and medical, so it's both in. And I just wanna keep reminding us that that really is this, um, if this was a resolution solely about physical health care, 
we wouldn't have it. This is a resolution about racism and public health, um, which we're wrestling with. Um, Teresa. Um, well, I guess I, I just um, feel like I need to sort of put out on the table that um, if we were sitting around the table, um, mm -hmm. that um, this resolution is not calling anyone a racist. Um, and um, <clears throat> I, I, I just, I guess I felt the need to say that because I mm -hmm. think sometimes when we talk about systemic racism, um, some sometimes people internalize that and and believe that we are calling people racists. And um, there's a distinct difference um, between those um, those two things. And so I, I just felt like I needed to put that out on the table that that is not what this resolution is doing. <clears throat> Teresa, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate, I personally appreciate your saying that. Um, I'm not quite sure where, I mean, we could have these, we could have a conversation all afternoon. Um, I, I, I would like to um, wait before we make any final action on the resolution until we hear from, um, rights and democracy and there, um, <clears throat> I know that Carl had been, and Carl, I really appreciate your um, uh, bringing someone um, today. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I guess my question to, to folks is, are there um, other people who you would like to hear from? And Julie, have we identified, have we asked other people already? We have invited other people um, a couple of times and have not gotten a response or have okay. gotten the response that they couldn't testify. Okay, thank you. So I guess I, I would just ask um, you all if there are other individuals or um, that you would like to 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 hear from. Um, that will be important for you before you um, decide how you're going to act on this. I'll think on that overnight. Okay, absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so switching um, subjects tomorrow, um, Julie, could, would you tell us um, who we're hearing from tomorrow at nine o'clock? Yes, we're going to hear from Dale, from uh, Champlain Services, and I'm looking for my list here. Let's see, and the Developmental Disabilities Council after Katie does a walkthrough of H243. Okay, so with H243, we are sort of um, chipping away at <clears throat> all those pieces of legislation that um, we had initially uh, identified at the beginning of this um, session, um, I believe. I'm, now I'm, I'm gonna stand corrected if someone um, corrects me. Um, <clears throat> clearly since that time, we have gotten um, other, uh, other bills that, um, and so we'll, we'll need to figure out either do we, what bills do we go back to? What do we want to have? Um, you know, if <clears throat> how many of the bills that have been introduced do we um, have the time? And does it make sense to get an introduction to so that we know what was there? Um, but in the time, you know, right now people are still talking about um, May twenty second as the the last day, um, if things go as they have gone in the past, um, soon the floor schedule may change um, and we may start being on the floor earlier than one earlier than one o'clock. Um, and that um, 
we have as um, whether it is uh, the child care bill um, or other bills that um, are in the Senate that hopefully we'll see will what we you know whether we agree with if they've if they've thought of making any changes in our wonderful work, but if they have, um, do we accept them? Um, and then we have also what's in the budget, um, and um, there are a couple of big issues that I think are. I don't to be honest, I'm not sure if it's in the budget or if it's in a separate piece of the budget, um, but housing. Um, and um, uh, I need to get together, we need to get together a small group to, to work inter, intercommittee, um, appropriations, uh, health care, human services, and house general in terms of looking at um, what has come over from the administration um, and the Senate. And so, um, I, and I guess I'm saying all of that in terms of I'm a little unclear right now um, as to what happens after next week uh, um, in terms of what we are looking at. Um, and before we um, left for lunch, um, Dan, if he is on and not frozen. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for, uh, it's been a very frustrating day with the internet. I keep dropping my Zoom, so hopefully I... Uh... I hang on here for a little bit. So um, what's happening with your bill in the Senate? What's happening with the um, the child, youth, and family advocate in the Senate? Great. Well, thanks for asking. Um, the, um, the bill has still not um, been entered into the committee. The morning committee in the Senate um, stops at the end of this week. So um, they will not be taking action on the bill um, at this point is what we heard from the chair. Um, in the Senate morning committee stop on May 4th. So uh, gives them time to, to act on um, committee of conferences and more floor time in the Senate. So um, unfortunately, looks like um, we're gonna have to uh, make sure we're on our game uh, when the session starts back up in January. Thank you. Disappointing, but very disappointing. Um, we'll we'll keep moving forward. We didn't get here in one day, so looking forward to seeing uh, that uh, taking some testimony in the Senate in January. Okay. Um, Madam Dan, Chair, the same is true for one fifty three as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I I am going to assume that the same is true for um, therapeutic dosage of buprenorphine, um, although uh, both they're having a hearing tomorrow morning, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday morning, um, both uh, a joint hearing between Senate Judiciary and um, Senate Health and Welfare. Uh, it, is, it is disappointing on all accounts. Um, that said, uh, people are you know people need to move in the in, at the timing and the way that they are most comfortable. And um, I, on some level, I guess I am seeing the glass half full in terms of the child, youth, and family advocate. It took about ten years to get it past the House. So um, the fact that we've gotten that far, um, I think, is is on some level huge. And um, we just need to really keep the pressure on and um, talk with um, not, not only the members of uh, Senate Health and Welfare, but people um, in the community who think that this is an important bill to move forward. And the same with the other two. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think that the... Um, Teresa, I think your the um, bill around Medicare is is less may still be hard to do, but it's less controversial, if I want to say, um, than um, some of the other things that we have. Now, 
we and the House thought that they were not controversial at all. In fact, any <laughs> of those I was going to say, bills, it depends upon which senator you ask, man. I know. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Um, but, you know, <laughs> so we will uh, try to go. Kelly, were you going to say something? No, you were just moving. Okay. Um, Can I? Is there anybody to say something little? Absolutely. I'm, on this same topic, I so last night I I tried to look at the budget areas that we worked so hard on, and um, I was curious. I can talk about that another day, but I was curious if um, Teresa, the budget piece, we had put money in on the bill that you passed, but we had also put it in into the budget. Do you know if it made it through the budget process? The cost of living increase is in the budget, yes. Okay, just not the added jump, right? Or um, not to the yeah, there, there wasn't, there was, it, it was a flat 2% cost of living increase in the, in the budget. Okay. So, because in the areas that I know more about, they pretty much went with us on everything. Um, I don't see any cuts. I mean, the Building Bright Futures still got their 261,000, the CIS, the 1.5 million, they, in, they really pushed on the reach up stuff that we had just written about, but not actually put numbers to, and they put numbers to it. Um, the, and then they added in parent-child care centers with a big bump, not to the base, but to, um, to them. And there's some other things too. So at some point we could talk about that if you want. And- um, Absolutely. I mean, those yeah. are things, those are things, and go ahead, Teresa. Oh, and, but, Carl, can you wait? Carl has his hand up. Oh, thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. I just thought maybe we should do some horse trading. Like we uh, will hold the chemical bill hostage until they, they get, <laughs> give us some of our bills back. How would that sound? <laughs> uh, I love you. You are, you are just so. <laughs> um, um, that's just what's happening right now. What? I'm sorry, Topper, what'd you say? I said, that's what's happening. They're holding <laughs> all that up until we get this chem chemical bill back to them. <laughs> um, Teresa. Uh, well, I was just going to uh, uh, mention the adult day programs. Um, th there was a big chunk of money um, uh, in addition to the 2%, uh, uh, there's $5 million in one-time money for uh, assistance with reopening and additional costs. And um, so that stayed in the budget, um, but there's a, like a whole language section we should take a look at next week. Um, I, I don't think people will have a problem with the language, but um, that's just my two eyes on it and uh, would appreciate um, you know, when we have a chance to look at that as a committee, yeah. it's it's essentially giving some additional flexibility and assurances that that five million will stay in adult days, even if it's spread out over a period of time. Yeah. And honestly, housing and nutrition that I didn't know as much about, but I'll say that there are some changes there. It's a little messy, so we probably won't. Well, house, um, housing is um, really complicated and it, <laughs> it it's not just in the budget there's um there's a whole housing plan in terms of the i'm sorry if uh, of in terms of people who do who do not have um a roof over their head people who are who are unhoused and who are currently in motels the plan is the plan from the administration right now is that they will leave their hotels um by July 1st, not quite sure where they're going to go. Um, um, I believe there's a, there's a tent camp um, uh, off, the, off of um, Pine Street um, in South Burlington. Um, don't know if that's going to enlarge. Anyway, um, th there's a plan. There's a plan that um, we have to think that um, this is what I was, I was alluding to which is um, not just us. And so it's really important that we don't go off on our own, but rather that um, uh, we work collaboratively, get the same information at, as much of at the same time um, with House General Appropriations and Healthcare, because some of the um, issue around um, 
people who have been identified as homeless who are now in hotels has to do with health care um, and mental health and stuff like that. Um, Topper then Dan. Thanks, Jessica. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we looked at the reasons why uh, people um, were in trouble in terms of housing? instead of moving them to a tent in the summer and moving them to a motel in the winter. Um, Tapper, um, I think you- Some of the, the legislation is talking about rehabbing housing and, mm -hmm. and putting uh, it up, but that's not gonna solve the problem. Um, you know, Tapper, you, that great minds think alike. And that is why um, we are involved and not just house general, which is more focused on um, the, the aspects of housing. But what are those things? What are the social supports or what are the other things? And then we share with, I mean, hell, we probably could have all 11 or 12 <laughs> committees focus on housing, but that's why there's so many. That's a great, um, a good point, Topper. Um, Dan. Just add quickly, there was a group uh, that met with the Lamoille County delegation on um, on Monday that was from the FQHC, um, Lamoille Housing, just kind of big picture looking at access to housing in Lamoille County as, as a health, you know, making sure people have that, um, that, that support to, to not keep going from hotel to being homeless back to hotel and and how that impacts their health and uh, wellness. So just thought I'd pass that. It was yeah. uh, it was a good good informational meeting, and they're they're really trying to plan um, how they can move forward here in Lamoille County with access to housing. Good, great. Um, so really, sort of, this is also the time of year where all sorts of things are gonna start happening. And it's like, oh my God, how did that happen? And they'll happen at really quick times and I'll get grumpy cause I'll go, how did that happen? And how come no one told me? And shouldn't we know? Um, and um, so let's just make sure that we all um, keep each other um, on this, you know, informed about what's going on because we're not in this, we're not in the same building we're not going to see each other in the cafeteria um, or run into each other. And um, let's begin to think about not being in the legislature for 11 months of the year. And in fact, getting out in May <laughs> at the end of May. Um, uh, so um, see you all tomorrow. Um, and uh when, um, and Topper gets mad at me when I call it Topper's bill, but when we take up, <laughs> when we take up the um, bill around um, the study or the evaluation or the, um, around autism. Um, and uh, so thank you all very much. And uh, please come, um, please, uh, <clears throat> if you, Please come to committee tomorrow um, with the expectation that uh, the committee is going to take action on S20. And um, so if you have um, thoughts that Katie needs to be involved in, please let Katie know. Um, and otherwise I will see you, I'll see you all at nine for something else instead. Uh, this um, ends our afternoon.